and what drew you specifically to emergency medicine? Yeah, so I thought that um, there were a few points. I thought that um, working in general medicine, especially fresh out of school, will help consolidate my learning that I did in my two years of PA school. I really like the mix of procedural medicine, so the opportunity to do um, suturing, laceration repairs. Um, because I, I always loved ortho, emergency medicine gives you the opportunity to see you know, fractures and casting, as well as um, uh, transitioning their care into like fracture clinics, so the orthopods there. And additionally, I like that um, you get an exposure to different um, different physician preferences as well so I work with like more than 50 docs and those are great opportunities to collaborate and provide patient care they always say that um, you know working with PAs and um, in the eMERGE like you have two great minds um, thinking about a patient case instead of just one so I think that's the beauty of um, working collaboratively but also like for me especially as a new grad PA um, I was able to kind of learn from all these different MD colleagues and kind of add to my toolbox in terms of what my preferences are um, in terms of patient care and especially when I present the case and propose different next steps. How is the Department of Emergency Medicine organized at your particular location? Yeah great question so we have um, four major areas so there's a resuscitation area where the more critical patients are and then there's the acute area and major area and then there's a rapid assessment zone which is usually where the PAs are situated so um, in terms of uh, the types of patients in these different respective depart um, areas of the department, um, CTAS is kind of what the triage nurse helps us to kind of categorize where these patients go. So in resuscitation area, you'll see the CTAS-1 patients. So patients with heart attack, anything that needs the doctor's immediate attention and they need to be monitored and they need to be taken care of right away. And then there's the acute and major area where you'll see a lot of the senior patients. Um, CTAS-2 to 3, I would say, is um, usually the average. You'd see patients who are COPD, um, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease exacerbation, um, or even patients who are query stroke and you want to make sure that um, you assess them, um, get the scan and things like that. And then in rapid assessment zone, you'll see a lot of CTAS three to five, I would say. So whether that be something as simple as suture removal, which you could even do at triage and send them home, or they actually make their way into a rapid assessment zone. Um, or something like a laceration that requires suturing or something like a broken bone so you would send them to x-ray and then you'll see them in the rapid assessment zone and um, help with casting and the next steps so lots of variety um, CTAS 1 through 5 and then different areas of the department and PAs I would say are usually in the rapid assessment zone and more so especially when doctors get pulled into the recess area or in the acute care area and um, PAs kind of take care of the workload in RAS and then uh, present to the, find the physician eventually and present to them. Can you expand upon what that impact has had on the department and other benefits of adding a PA to the practice or to the eMERGE department has been like? We hear a lot of um, physicians who are thankful for um, PAs being able to do procedures because that's something that um, does take time depending on the um, extent of the laceration or even um, even casting uh, for a patient who has a broken bone that requires a reduction under sedation. So a physician having to manage the sedation aspect as well as the casting or during a night shift where they don't have a PA or in that small window where they don't have PA coverage um, versus a PA actually being there to do the casting and they can kind of share that workload. So in terms of sharing the physician's workload, I think that uh, physicians are grateful and it helps them prioritize seeing the higher acuity cases while we uh, help, help see the, the quick patient visits where we can kind of see them and the doctor checks in at the end and make sure that everything looks good before the patient leaves the department. And from the patient's side, we actually help reduce wait time. So some of these patients can be brought in sooner because we're sharing that workload with the physician. And um, based on the CTAS level and based on which department, area of the department they're going to, um, their, their visit might look different because there's a PA um, in the department versus when there's not a PA and everything kind of falls on the physician and the rest of the team to take care of them. So can you talk about some of the common conditions that you may see that present to the emergency department? Lots of variety in the eMERGE. So I guess if I take a head to toe approach, I can say we see a lot of headaches, um, sore throats and URI, which is upper respiratory infections, especially with COVID. Um, and then chest pain, um, shortness of breath, 
abdominal pain, and then musculoskeletal pain, which could be anywhere in the body, so shoulder pain, upper extremity pain, or lower extremity pain, whether it's um, the joints, so knee joint, hip pain, um, ankle pain, foot pain, so many different varieties, or um, back pain is a very common one, whether it's something acute or something that they've been dealing with for a long time. And then um, branching off from this, the different differential diagnoses to consider, you would want to rule out the, the scary ones in the eMERGE. So for chest pain, you want to rule out myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, pulmonary embolism, um, pneumothorax, and then for abdominal pain, common ones you want to rule out is uh, cholecystitis or um, cholangitis, which is a bit more scary, and appendicitis is a common one, as well as if it's a, a female um, of reproductive age, then ectopic pregnancy. Um, so different different varieties, um, different differential diagnoses to consider, and you want to rule out the, the big scary ones, but also if it's not that, reassure them and make sure they have proper follow-up. So it sounds like there's a variety of uh, different things that patients can come in with. Um, what are uh, procedures that you can perform? Um, what's in your repository of skill sets in your toolbox? Yes, um, I am smiling because I really enjoy uh, the procedures that we get to do in eMERGE. I really like suturing, so um, we get lacerations and uh, PAs really help with suturing and um, handling that aspect of uh, patient care. And um, casting, so for the different fractures, whether it be like a ankle fracture or um, a wrist fracture, we can help with casting and this could be done under sedation because there's reduction being done before you cast or just in the rapid assessment zone. So uh, draining abscesses and uh, lastly irrigation of the ear. I think that's a very common and probably the most rewarding because patients come in with you know pain or I can't hear at all and then you just flush their ear out and they're like super thankful. Um, and those are the common ones, I would say, and there are a few other ones like um, draining a paronychia, so like um, that would still kind of fall under IND. Um, foreign body removal is a common one, so one I can think of is removing like a, the backing of an earring from someone's earlobe after months, um, or uh, removing something from the, the foot after they stepped on it, or uh, ingrown toenail removal of that and taking care of that so much variety and sometimes it's like I can't think of it because it's unique but anything that kind of walks through the door you just um, try to improvise and figure out a way to help the patient out and make sure they have proper follow-up. So what kind of patients uh, are you seeing or treating in, um, in the eMERGE? Uh, so there's a lot of variety in terms of the patients we see in eMERGE. So it could be uh, pediatric, so like a few months old, or um, geriatric, so it can be like even 100 years old. So lots of variety in age. Um, another factor is the cultural background. So at the particular location I work at, um, speaking Tamil really helps with the patient population and addressing language barriers. So I find that that helps me connect with patients uh, because you see this like um, relief where the patient, like the patient knows that I speak the same language so they're not as nervous about the visit and they can really tell me what's going on instead of um, even that additional step of calling a family member um, it saves that and it also provides the reassurance for the patient care so lots of variety in age cultural background socioeconomic status um, especially in the eMERGE and, um, and that is in addition to the variety of cases and uh, presentations we see and what can a patient expect if they're going to be seen by a PA yeah, so I think the first thing that comes to mind is that a patient can expect two great minds to work on their patient visit. So um, when the PA, the PA walks in and starts the visit, taking the history and doing the appropriate physical exam, they go back and they discuss the case with a supervising physician. And that's where the collaborative aspect of discussing what is happening and what could be the, like the differentials to consider and differential diagnoses to consider and next steps in terms of investigations to order and management options. Um, so I think it is a win-win in that um, the PA works collaboratively to share the workload with the physician and the um, the patient actually sees the PA but also the supervising physician and gets input from both sides to provide them with the best care possible. You were a new grad that had been hired onto the emergency department. What did your orientation look like? How did they prepare you to, to work as a PA? Yeah, no, that's a great question because I was very lucky to be um, joining a team of PAs who were already well established at the um, institution that I was working at. So I got about one month to help transition into or 
oriented to my role and this involved tagging along with one of the senior PAs and seeing how things are done in the department but also learning their preferences and um, everyone kind of had one mentor and I really like the the teaching style of my mentor where it was kind of um, you know just just doing it and learning and then getting feedback from her as well as when I present to the MDs like she was kind of supportive but also letting me learn from the MDs as well so there were different teaching styles um, other senior PAs were very supportive and they would ask you what your comfort level was but I think that that team bra team based approach um, with the PA supporting you but also the MDs understanding that you're just um, onboarding was very supportive and um, we also had additional sessions. So we had a casting workshop, we had um, a teaching workshop where we covered like common presentations in the Emerge and what your approach would be for those cases. And um, we also had an ultrasound workshop, which was something that I really enjoyed as well because at uh, where, where I work, um, POCUS, which is point of care ultrasound, is, very, um, is a commonly used tool at the bedside. So that's something that PAs are involved in and something we got exposure to so we know when we can use that. Um, when a patient presents with different complaints like appendicitis or even like a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, you want to do a bedside ultrasound and see if you have to expedite their care. How did PA school prepare you for the job that you're in now? Yeah, I think that's a great question because that's something that I always um, take time to reflect on. Um, even though PA school is only two years, uh, you do learn a lot. And I think even your first year in practice, um, especially in emergency medicine, the steep learning curve, it's almost like drinking from a fire hose. So um, PA school prepares you for that um, steep learning curve and being that absorbing sponge, especially as a new grad PA. I think that depending on where you did your rotation, so I did a few rotations up north and then a lot in the, the GTA, the greater Toronto area. So um, that gave me exposure to specific patient population and specific types of cases. But um, where I work now, it's different patient population and you're always, adapting to who you're working with in terms of your your colleagues but also the patient and uh, medicine is you know it's a lifelong learning process so PA school prepared me but I think that you continue to learn on the job and I think that the U of T curriculum definitely did give me the the foundation to kind of build off of um, into practice. There are many physicians that have never had exposure to PA mm -hmm. and they're not really sure what to expect when working with one so some say that it's like working with a resident or a fellow that never leaves your rotation. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that assessment or how would you explain to a physician what it's like to work with PA if they've never had exposure before? So yeah, I think that um, comparison to residents that never leave is a good um, example or analogy. However, I think that I always um, hear that PAs extend physician services. So. It's funny, I actually heard from one of my supervising talks that he was asked if he was a PA last time. So it's, it's amazing to see the progress that PAs have made in Canada, especially the ones at this location over the past few years, where um, the way that the doctor kind of takes care of a patient case, PAs have been doing something similar so that it's almost um, synonymous. That is not to say that it is synonymous title-wise, but our scope of practice do reflect that of our supervising physicians. So whether it's being a resident or whether it's being um, you know, a physician extender, I think that PAs um, can kind of serve that versi versatile role in filling in um, different, different aspects of care. What is PA scope of practice? We mention that word a lot, but what, is, what yeah. does that actually mean? Yeah, so PA scope of practice, um, usually we say mirrors that of their supervising physician. In the emergency department, um, depending on the doc you work with and depending on what's needed on that particular day, um, a PA could be doing a lot of procedures or um, helping out with doing the history and physical exams and getting the patient visit started. So I have had days where um, I'm on a night shift and from 6, 6 p.m. to about 11 um, p.m. I'll be seeing patients, kind of reviewing the patient cases and then making sure their investigations are there, following up on that, um, and then management options and discharge. So there was one day where I came back from my dinner break and I actually spent most of my time in the rapid assessment zone, which is 
Raz and I saw I think about nine lacerations and took care of that while the doctor was in the resuscitation um, area and um, the acute care area of uh, emergency department and seeing those patients. So I think based on what's needed in the department your your role and your scope of practice will vary but the beauty of um, being in emergency medicine is that your scope of practice can, has a potential to keep kind of broadening and expanding and it's really up to you as the PA to kind of find those opportunities to kind of add to your toolbox and you know learn where you can help out and help streamline patient flow. Excellent. Um, what is the PAMD relationship like? How do you work with um, the 50 different positions that you work with? Yeah, um, it is very great. <laughs> I think that um, the PAs who uh, joined at this uh, location like years ago have really established the PA role very well. Um, it really depends on the supervising physician. So when you start off, you're a bit more, um, there's a bit more guidance in terms of learning their preferences, but also, you know, you gaining that trust with that supervising physician. But as time goes on and you're able to kind of, um, you know, show them your thought process and how you kind of think through cases, you're able to build a bit more um, autonomy and that will vary based again based on the supervising physician and the nature of the case so um, I think that uh, for example when I started if I sutured a patient I would ask the physician to check it um, to make sure that they're happy with it and then as time goes on they're happy with you suturing providing discharge instructions they would have started the visit and then just stepping in and saying hey like any questions and everything is good okay you're good to go just you know follow up in seven to ten days to get your sutures removed and then reviewing their signs of infections to look out for um, and then sometimes you wouldn't even, um, you, when you do the history and physical and the, page, uh, the supervising physicians in recess taking care of a patient, you would actually get the order started because at that point you're a bit more comfortable with the physician, you know their preferences, so you would order certain things. And um, if you had a question about something, you would hold off on that until they come back from recess and then you can add that on as an add-on test. But there's different levels and it depends on the physician, but also the, the nature of the case. And I did say like working with so many docs, there's an opportunity to learn, but there's also this, um, this other side to it where you have to kind of keep adapting uh, based on their preferences and uh, depending on who you're presenting to kind of tweaking what um, you would propose as the next steps. But I think you also, as you kind of continue to grow and become an experienced PA yourself, you start um, building your own preference, which is one of the things that my my mentor kind of told me about um, when I was orienting to the job they're like you'll learn the physician's preference but then you start kind of figuring out what your preferences are when you propose and then you this actually um, sparks discussion so you're like okay so this is why I think we should do this or this is why I think this could be appropriate next steps and then the physicians like oh why do you think that you would have that discussion um, and apart from the physicians and PAs uh, that you work with in the department uh, what other healthcare providers are you also interacting with in the ED and what is that like um, so I think the beauty of Emerge is that we work collaboratively. So um, the interprofessional healthcare team is very big in the Emerge. I work with nurses, I work with ward clerks, respiratory therapists, um, social workers, um, and different consultants, whether this is like general surgeons, um, orthopedic surgeons, or even crisis, which is the team for psych. Um, psych. And, um, I can't even, like there's probably way more, but I think the because we're on front line and we have the opportunity to um, refer and get opinions from different consultants, there's, a, there's the opportunity to work with multiple um, allied health professionals. And you started your PA career during the pandemic. Um, so what impact mm -hmm. do you think that has had on uh, whether that was you or the department? Uh, what has that been like? So in my first few months, I did not know what most of my colleagues look like. I had to identify them basically by their eyes and uh, maybe their scrub cap, but um, the PPE, so um, we had to wear scrub caps, masks and 95s, um, you know, face shield and a lot of different, um, a lot of PPE, which um, I think took away that personal touch in terms of uh, orienting myself to the Emerge team. But regardless, I was still able to kind of um, bond with the, the team and um, get to know, you know everyone and their personalities. And I think that was one, one aspect of how the pandemic impacted my um, transition into, into my new role. 
So we saw a lot of presentations with patients having sore throat, chest pain, shortness of breath, and making sure that it was not COVID. But after um, we started vaccinating and we started seeing cases drop, uh, more patients started presenting with um, abdominal pain that has been going on for uh, many months that they didn't come in for earlier on because of the pandemic and they didn't want to come in to the eMERGE. So we started seeing more of those patients and the variety actually started um, broadening um, as the COVID cases started going down. So it's still something that we keep in our differential, you know, always try to rule out COVID, but thankful for vaccination and thankful for, um, you know, the opportunity for people to somewhat return back to their uh, normal lives, which also brings in the, um, the variety of cases into the eMERGE.